Okay, welcome back after break. Uh, we before we went for a break, we were uh, looking studying chapter six. We began studying chapter six. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, we looked at uh, you know the this thought that you know reformation paves the way for revival, and it results in the restoration of the church. And what are the areas there is restoration in the church? The first one is restoration of spiritual truths. Okay, so there's a, a whole list of spiritual truths that have been listed out for us on page number uh, 77 and 78. The first one is salvation by grace through faith. So one of the most critical truths that the church rediscovered during the Protestant Reformation was that salvation comes by grace through faith and not by works so that was all uh, you know they uh, they based this on ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 now this understanding was hidden uh, by the teachings of the church basically by various practices indulgences and practices that imply that salvation could be earned that's how the church became very very rich they were getting money from people uh, uh, if they wanted to receive salvation, they would have to pay money. If they wanted their sins to be forgiven, they had to pay money, right? So this whole understanding of salvation by grace through faith was hidden by the church, for, uh, by the church because of the practices that it was uh, uh, involved in. So reformers like Martin Luther, he brought back this truth into focus, making it clear that faith in Christ alone is the way that you can be reconciled back to God. You can have a relationship back with God. Okay. The second one is water baptism for the believer. So as the church was moving forward, it also, uh, you know, this re re uh, recover the importance of water baptism for believers. Okay. Uh, uh, which became like, you know, they, uh, uh, they said that was mandatory or important uh, for a public declaration of a person's faith in Christ Jesus. Okay. Now, earlier in the church, baptism was a central practice, but over time it became more of a ritual and a personal decision of faith. Okay. But when the Anabaptists, remember the Anabaptists? We studied about the Anabaptists, right? The Anabaptists and the other reformers. They reintroduced the idea that baptism was reserved only for believers. Believers are who? Those who have accepted the Lord Jesus as their personal savior, who declare their faith, okay, and not traditions like, you know, infant, infant baptism, okay? So there was infant baptism. The Anabaptists came up and they said, no, uh, infant baptism is not what is required, but, uh, you know, adult baptism of believers who have put their faith and trust in God. Then third one is sanctification and holy living. Um, so with the rediscovery of this truth that justification is by faith, came a renewed emphasis of sanctification. Okay, what is sanctification? It's living a life set apart, holy for God. So the church was reminded that the believers are to grow in holiness, not just accept salvation and then be inactive, you know, but the focus of, uh, you know, personal holiness was the key component uh, in many of the revival movements, uh, such as the Methodist revival, which was brought about by John Wesley. Uh, who preached that, you know, ongoing process of salvation in Christian life is very, very important, okay? Then the next one, um, the fourth one is understanding and welcoming the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So throughout the centuries, uh, the church was basically rediscovering the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Now, the early church, the Holy Spirit we see was very central, right? We studied in chapter two. The person in the work of the Holy Spirit was very central to their gatherings, to their uh, their uh, teachings, their mission work. However, as the the church grew, the institutional institutionalized church grew. You know, the role of the Holy Spirit, you know, was downplayed. Okay, or 
it was often even misunderstood. So the revivalists in the 18th and the 19th century, they helped to basically reawaken uh, the church's recognition of the Holy Spirit's role in convicting, in guiding, and empowering believers. So that we see was brought back during the 18th and the 19th century. Then the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, the next one is baptism of the Holy Spirit. The early 20th century, the Pentecostal movement, you know, it actually marked a key, um, a key moment in the discovery of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Like we see in the book of Acts, uh, the believers were reminded of the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, you know, not just in bringing about personal edification for someone, but also empowering them to do missions and also for the work of the ministry. That, Like we read in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, okay, when Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses okay so that, that truth was almost forgotten for centuries and then it became foundational for many modern christian movements that we see today uh, in the early 20th pentecostal uh, movement okay earlier 20th century when the pentecostal uh, movement uh, started it marked the key movement of the rediscovery of the baptism of the holy spirit the next one is the gifts of the spirit so along with the baptism of the holy spirit came the restoration of the gifts of the spirit such as prophecy healing speaking in tongues and miracles now for many years these gifts were seen as something that cease or stop, you know, after the time of the apostles in the book of Acts. So many of them thought that all of this had stopped. It was only for the time of the apostles. But during revivals, believers rediscovered the power of these gifts to and how to use these gifts to build up the church, edify the church, strengthen the church, and also, uh, you know, preach and teach and reach the world with them gospel of Jesus Christ. The next one is growing in the knowledge of his word. Okay. Now, finally, the church was progressively being restored um, uh, by its love and pursuit for the knowledge of the word of God. So after periods of time, you know, the Bible was, um, uh, you know, available to everyone, to every common people. Before that, the Bible was only available to the clergy in Latin, okay? And then we see the movements like the Protestant Reformation. It made scripture accessible to everyone. And we know reformers like William Tyndale, who translated the Bible into common languages so that all believers, they believed, and even um, uh, John Wycliffe all believed that common believers, everyone had the right to have the Bible in their hand and study the word of God for themselves so that they will have a deeper understanding of the knowledge and the word of God and the will of God for their lives and also for the church. Okay. Then the next one is victorious Christian living, top of page number 78. So in the early church periods, you know, the aspects of Christian living was uh, you know, actually overshadowed by doctrines um, and uh, doctrines that were emphasizing guilt, you know, penance and legalism. So everything became very legalistic. Penance, that means, oh, if you did this sin, you have to, you know, do this, this, this ritual. You have to pay so much of money. You have to make the sacrifice, you know, and also a lot of doctrines that were emphasizing and making people very, very guilty. So, when these reformers who God ro uh, raised up and the revivalists, the church basically rediscovered the truth uh, that in Christ believers are more than conquerors. Like we read in Romans chapter 8 verse 37. Okay, We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Okay, So these reformers started to preach that, hey, all of us have access to God's grace and which enables us to live in peace, joy, and strength, even in the midst of the trials and tribulations that we face. So this victorious life isn't marked by the absence of difficulties, but an inner assurance of God's presence and power, uh, helping believers to rise above their circumstances, 
their te temptations and their setbacks. So what were the key uh, aspects of victorious uh, Christian living that is, um, was reiterated at this time is basically walking in the spirit. Galatians chapter 5. Okay, Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. Overcoming sin, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 where it says, trusting in God's power to resist sin and temptation. Okay, and abundant life, John chapter 10 verse 10. Okay, uh, living with the fullness of God's peace, joy and purpose. So these things were uh, like key aspects of victorious Christian living that was taught during this time. Okay. Any questions on that first point? What was the rest? How did the revival uh, restore the church? The first one was understanding the spiritual truths. Any more questions? Any questions on that? Yeah. Uh, it's not uh, directly relevant, but uh, uh, water baptism for the believer. Hmm. Now, most of us have water baptism uh, during our uh, uh, the christening time and, you know, when we are like infants, like children. Hmm. So hmm. Uh, is it like also required to have a water baptism as you are like led uh, later in the dipping and the thing in the tank? And, uh, uh, when you the, become nowadays. an adult? Yes, nowadays. So, yeah. What is a biblical... Uh, uh, stand of uh, water baptism is that we don't see any infant baptism happening. We see those who believed, who accepted, believed and repented of their sins, they were baptized in the water. That is what John came to preach. John preached the baptism of repentance. Jesus also said, repent and be uh, baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. So that is what we see that is biblically right and that is what we need to do. So some of us like you and me who were raised up in the Methodist church who are infant baptized uh, when we have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior we can uh, take water baptism. Yes, adult water baptism. Yes. Uh, by not taking it does not mean that we are not in uh, entering the kingdom of God. You're not entering adult, the adult, kingdom of God. Uh, adult water baptism. No, no, because many of them who were like uh, you know they cannot take water baptism in some places because you know they are coming from different faiths and they will be persecuted and they know where to go, especially women and you know all the children and teens and all. So it's understandable. But those of us who can, we can, uh, because it's basically a powerful proclamation of what our spiritual identification with what Jesus has done for us uh, on the cross and spiritually identifying with his death, uh, burial, his resurrection, his ascension and him being seated. And also it is, uh, you know, so when we're identifying with that, uh, it is a powerful, um, our spiritual identification is also there and it's also something that, you know, uh, brings up the uh, we receive those blessings you know and the uh, uh, we receive the the powers of sin that is uh, broken um, we are saying basically we are saying yes to the will of god uh, we are saying yes to what god wants us to do at that time which is right and also we are saying yes to the kingdom of god to being extended to our lives and also it is a powerful um uh, you know uh, no, actually, when we are baptized, uh, it is we are receiving all of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. The full benefits, uh, the what He has done on the cross, what He's received for us, is becomes our portion. And also, there is uh, we receive breakthroughs, healing, restoration, all that we can believe when we are taking part in water baptism. So it has a much greater spiritual significance apart from just you know uh, that we are proclaiming that we are a, a, a believer of Lord Jesus Christ, that we're saying yes to what God has asked us to do in Scripture, what is right, uh, but also this powerful proclamation that we are making and the benefits that we receive. Yes. Yes, Kofi? So, ma'am, I would like to ask, at what age is it appropriate to baptize someone? A child maybe at the age of 15 or at what age is it appropriate to baptize uh, someone 
Yes, good question. Uh, in our church, we've had children as young as uh, seven, eight years also being baptized. Of course, uh, you know, um, we speak with their parents. Their parents tell us that, yes, they have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they have spoken to them about the significance of baptism, and they want to be baptized. So we've had children as young as eight nine years at APC being baptized, water baptized, because they've accepted the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Yes. So it depends upon the child, the parents, and their understanding, and, uh, you know, what the spiritual significance and what they're partaking in, and also if they've accepted the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Yes. Did that help, Kofi? Thank you. Yes. Sorry, I missed out two points there. The role and function of the fivefold office and the equipping of the saints in the work of the ministry. So the fivefold office um, refers to the ministry that uh, roles that I described in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, that of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Um, now, these roles are gifts given to the church by Christ himself, and they are, you know, to equip believers, build up the body of Christ, and help the church to grow in spiritual maturity. Now, we see that throughout church history, the fivefold offices were, sorry, sometimes misinterpreted, they were neglected or reduced to just one or two roles. That one or two roles is just the role of the pastor and the teacher. Okay, the, but the full restoration of this fivefold offices uh, has been significant in equipping the church for its mission, helping the body of Christ function uh, with greater diversity and unity as God originally intended for it. Okay, so we look at it um, at the bottom of page number 78. We'll come to it and we'll see that in detail. Also, we see the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Okay, now the concept of equipping the saints uh, refers to, you know, basically preparing and empowering all believers to participate in the work of the ministry, like we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. Um, you know, uh, it was not just the role of the fivefold office, but also for the others to do work, uh, to equip the others, to train the others. Uh, to um, uh, build up the others so that every Christian can fulfill their God-given calling, okay? So, uh, you know, we know that this was not there during the dark ages and some periods where it was only left to the clergy, the pastors, but also, uh, you know, many reformers came and said, hey, each one of us can you know, read God's word and just preach and teach. And we know that before Martin Luther, we had that person who, uh, you know, um, I think his name was um, Philip or Matthew, who, you know, was a businessman, very rich man. He was uh, just touched by Matthew chapter uh, 10. And I think he just preached that and how that led to reformation, right? Before, uh, before Martin Luther. Remember, we studied that? You all don't remember? Uh, where where is that page number? Oh, Peter Waldo. Yes, Matthew chapter ten, uh, page number thirty three. Okay, Peter Waldo, who was a wealthy uh, merchant, you know, he was so impressed by the Lord's instruction in Matthew chapter ten. He went preaching that, and that brought about uh, reformation. So before Martin Luther, we see um, all of these people. John Husk, we see uh, John Wycliffe, and before that, you know, uh, Peter Waldo, right? So they also were common people who went about doing ministry and reaching out to many, okay? So any more questions on that before we move to point two? Okay, we're on page number 78. Restoration of the wine skin to contain new wine. So can somebody please read uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 17, please. Nor do they put new wine into old wine skins, or else the wine skins break, the wine is spilled, and the wine skins are ruined. But 
they put new wine into new wine skins and both are preserved amen so here in matthew chapter 9 verse 17 jesus is saying that the new wine skin a uh, new wine should be put into what new wine skins why yes it will preserve both the wine and the wine skin so that the if you put in an old wine skin when the new wine ferments it will expand it will it will burst the old wine skin and the wine skin will be ruined the wine will also be ruined so the new wine here represents the fresh moves of god it also represents new revelations or deeper outpouring of the holy spirit so what is the new wine represent here it represents fresh moves of god new revelations or deeper outpourings of the holy spirit so the new the the wine skins what are wine skins they represent the structures forms methods systems that the church uses to contain or carry the new move of god so why a wine skin is a container right it's basically a container that holds wine and um, in this analogy it refers to the external external structures or systems through which the church functions so what are some of the external systems or structures that the church functions uh, governance the governing bodies governance models uh, forms of worship we have different forms of worship in different places uh, leadership styles and even uh, the overall culture of the church okay now as a wine expands and ferments it requires a flexible new wine skin to hold it right if the wine is put into an old uh, rigid wine skin the wine skin can burst wasting both the wine and the wine skin so what are some of the key points in this context is the wine skin basically represents the church structures okay just as the wine holds the why sorry the wine skins hold the wine uh, the church structures like the leadership models the methods of evangelism the worship styles and the discipleship processes that different churches have uh, you know they are meant to contain and steward what god is doing but as god pours out fresh revelation and new movements of the spirit the church needs to adapt its structures to accommodate these changes and these new moves of god okay the old systems and methods that were effective in one season might not be suitable in this new season or this new move of god or this dynamic move of god okay so the new wine skin churches what are the new wine skin churches or what do we mean by new wine skin churches basically churches that are adapting to god's move so what are we saying we are saying that churches need to be very flexible and willing to adjust to what god is doing in a particular season okay so we need to be a new wine skin church one that is opening to change willing to adopt new strategies and not stuck up to the old traditions or systems that are no longer effective we see that many people are living leaving the mainline churches and going to more charismatic independent churches why because everything has become so uh yeah ritualistic you know same thing they feel that people are just saying it like a recitation like you know like we all know you know a b c d e f g h i j k like that you know or ba ba black sheep have you any wool yes sir yes sir or twinkle twinkle little star so we can just rattle it all off you know even if somebody work, wakes you up in the in your sleep and tells you to say baba black sheep you will just say it or twinkle twinkle little star you will just narrate it or a b c d you will just you don't even have to be like wide awake so like some of these um, traditions that the yes reading it you know and sometimes without any breath just fully without any meaning or seeing the significance of um, it so you know we should not be stuck up in old traditions or systems that are no longer effective right 
and I, I um, appreciate many, many of the mainline churches, they are noticing that many of their uh, young families, young people are leaving their churches and going to the uh, you know, independent churches. So they're trying to do a study. They're trying to see how we they can retain their traditions, yet improvise on uh, that. So that is like, you know, being new wineskin church, ch churches where we are adopting to see, you know, what is the context that we are in, how we can adopt to adapt ourselves to the, the move of God and what God wants to do in and through our church. And also the new wine skin churches avo uh, avoid irrelevance. Churches that resist change, hold on to old structures. These are not in your uh, textbook. I am just, uh, you know, made my own notes. So if you want to take it down, it's, you, you can. So churches that resist change, they hold on to old structures. You know, they become old wineskins. Uh, they be, they may become very irrelevant or lose the spiritual impact. And such churches may fail to, you know, fully impact or lead their, um, their congregation, their sheep into experiencing the power of God, the, the move of God. And also they would miss out on sustaining the new move of God. God wants to do something, but he, you know, uh, if we are not able to contain it with our outdated methods, there won't be any move of God. We can be a hindrance for that. So many of you ask this question, why aren't our churches like the early church? One of the reasons can be this, right? We are, you know, not being new wineskin churches. We want to still be that old wineskin churches. And then also focus on function over form. Now, the point of the wine skin is to contain the wine, right? Not to glorify the container. Which is more important, the wine skin or the wine? wine. The wine in the wine skin. In the same way, you know, the church structures are important only to the extent that they can effectively carry out the move of God. If they're not effective in carrying out the move of God, the mission of God, then they have to do away with those things and focus on what God is asking them to do so that the new wine, they can contain it, they can preserve it, uh, you know, and um, they can experience the fresh move of God. Okay. So did you all get that? Yes. In the same point too, we also have the restoration of the fivefold offices okay so as part of creating new wine skins the church must also restore the fundamental or the foundational truths and offices so they should not say hey we don't need apostles we don't need prophets we only need evangelist pastors and teachers you know some churches say that right so hey we need all of these why do we need all of these fivefold offices because Ephesians 4.11 says, what are the roles of these fivefold offices? Hello, what is the role of these fivefold offices? I taught you when I was filling in for Pastor Paul Emmanuel. What is the role of the fivefold? Huh? Yeah, those are the fivefold offices. But what is the role of, what is their role? Uh, Edify the church? To build the churches, build up the churches. Yes, to build up the body of Christ, to equip yes. the body of Christ, to strengthen the believers, to nurture them. Okay, so these new wine uh, skin churches tend to emphasize, you know, the restoring and the importance of all of these fivefold offices and empowering all believers, not just a select few, to participate in the ministry. That is also very, very important. Some churches. The pastor is only I, me, myself, right? I, me, myself, philosophy, methodology. You know, I am the all in all. I am the great I am in this church. But that is not how the Bible defines it. The Bible defines the fivefold offices. Everyone, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, is important in the edifying, edifying, building up, nurture, spiritual nurturing of the church. And the church has to come to a place where they are actually restoring all of these fivefold offices to be the new wineskin 
uh, church and also empowering all of the believers to be ministers. Like in APC, we say every believer is a minister. Right? Now just to select few. Okay, the fourth one. Um, here we see, uh, you know, the bullet point fourth one, unity and fellowship in the spirits. What do we mean by the new wineskin churches being united and in fellowship with the spirit? The new wineskin churches must foster unity and cooperation across denominational lines. Something that we all need to do, bring all the pastors in our city together. You know, one day we can just all meet together and pray, worship together. So the new wineskin of God's spirit can, you know, is not just confined to one denomination or doctrinal division. Instead, it encourages the fellowship of believers or fellowship or unity among the believers from various backgrounds working together for the kingdom of God. We also need to see how we can partner together uh, to build God's kingdom. And we'll be studying about that in the publication um, uh, kingdom builders, how we can partner across denominations to build the kingdom of God. And the next bullet point is the release of mov movements that help form new wineskin churches. So what does that mean? So that means that in every generation, God raises up movements that acts like catalysts for change. Okay, so these movements uh, challenge the existing, can challenge the existing structures uh, and also the very call of the church uh, to adapt to the new work that God is doing. Now, for example, in history, uh, when we look at the Protestant Revelation, uh, Reformation, sorry, the Protestant Reformation or the Pentecostal movement or the charismatic movements, we see that all of these movements helped create new wineskin churches by introducing new methods of worship, governance, and ministry, uh, which aligns with God's current move or the work of God, right? So we see that rather than the formal structure that the church was happening, when the Pen Protestant Reformation happened, Pentecostal movement happened, the charismatic movement happened, we see that it brought about new methods of worshiping God, governance, ministry, and also aligning to God's current move that he was bringing about. Now we can ask this question, why new wineskins matter? Okay, what is the importance of creating new wineskins? Okay, so the importance of creating these new wineskins basically lies in the church's ability to carry and sustain what God is pouring out. God wants to pour out like the early church, but we are not willing. We are very rigid. We are caught up with our own fame, name, with our own denominations, with our own cultures, with our own traditions, and we are not willing to change. Okay. So without being flexible uh, and without have, having structure, structures that are adaptable, the church basically risks missing out the fullness of God's power and presence that he wants to pour out. Right. So sometimes we really need to be flexible, even in, in church when God is just saying, okay, I just want you to spend no preaching today, nothing, just worship. And then we are just worshiping God and we can experience a move of God. That does not happen every Sunday. It's like a one-off thing, but we just do that. Or God is uh, pressing upon the heart of the people, uh, you know, let's pray for extended periods of time. So every evening meet for praise and worship. 60 days, 2 months, 3 months, 4 months, you know, or, um, you know, studying God's word or studying about revival or studying about the end times and what we need to do as a church. So all that is God is trying to move. And we're saying, no, you know, we already have a structure here, God. You know, we can't go away from the structure. So we'll think about what you're talking to us, telling us. We'll think about next year. We'll include that in our pulpit plan. No, when we see things that are happening and God wants us to address that, we change things accordingly so that he can move in his power and his presence. Okay. So as reformation and revival continue, the church must develop new wineskins to contain the new wine 
And what is this new wine? The fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit, new levels of faith, strength, and revelation. Okay? So just to summarize, we're saying that these new wineskin churches are those who are willing to embrace, change, adapt to the new move of God, develop fresh methods of doing ministry, ensure that the church remains relevant, impactful, and aligned with ongoing work of God's work in this world. Okay? Before we move on to the reformation of the fivefold offices, anyone has any questions? Hello. Yes, yes, uh, Lucy, we can hear you now. Present day uh, mainline churches, how do we bring in the uh, the changes of a new new wine churches like thing? The new wine skin churches, how can the pre how do the present day churches yeah. adapt to it? Yeah, mainline churches. Okay, I think it's more like um, the worship styles that are there. Uh, you know, doing away with liturgy and you know the the traditional things and also you know um, having structured um, you know um, uh, sermon titles or sermons that cater to every area and uh, sphere um, uh, or the things that people are going through addressing every area of the of the church life um, also studying a, a, a book in the Bible, uh, teaching about family, marriage, parenting, um, revival, um, you know, uh, the present day situations. And all of those things are some of those topics that have been taken up, included. Also uh, restoring the fivefold office in the church. Also uh, restoring this whole thing about, you know, um, Every believer is a minister. Every believer has to be equipped, has to go out and, um, you know, fulfill the uh, great commission. Um, and also, um, you know, the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and preaching and teaching uh, accompanied with signs, miracles, and um, wonders. So I think this is what uh, the present, uh, you know, churches today are uh, following after new wineskin churches. Um, so we are in a period where God's glory is going to be manifest in a greater way. Uh, so accommodating that to uh, raise up every believer to, you know, manifest his glory uh, through science, miracles, and wonders, the supernatural, and also equipping them uh, with the word of God to teach the truth of the word of God. Yeah. Did that help, Lucy? Yes, sister, but only in some churches we see the fivefold office fully in work. Mm -hmm. But not in all the churches. Yeah, that's see. what we're saying. That's a need for them to become new wineskin churches if they want to see the glory of God being okay. restored. Yes. The Giving power the of God. Speaking about this, they can yes. bring the people to this uh, fivefold ministry. Yes. Specifically, okay. many of the churches who need to come to a place to understand the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, okay. which is lacking. Yes, sister. They have not. Uh, yeah, mainland churches where we don't see about the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, anointing of the Holy Spirit, and uh, speaking in tongues and all. Yes, not gifts of the Holy Spirit moving in the gifts. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, sister. We need to pray for them, even as you're part of the mainline church. Even as we were raised up in a mainline church, they had much to do in our spiritual upbringing. We're thankful to them. But we also need to pray that they would move to the next level that God wants to take them and move them into. Yes. And just a follow-up question to what Sister Lucy asked. Now, uh, in a, a just a follow-up question to what mm -hmm. Sister asked. Now, uh, who's actually responsible in the mainline churches, like uh, the depreciation? Because we've seen, I know you, I'm sure you'll agree, like, you know, in our days, like, there was no place to sit in the Methodist church then, you know. Mm -hmm. There was, like, you have to wait if you're, like, late, you're, like, thing. Now, it's just the number of things going. So, I've been a part of it on, that's why, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't say charismatic church, but I would say, like, more spirit-filled, word-filled, other places where I go and, you know. Uh, getting more equipped and getting built up in, in the faith. So who's responsible? The reason I'm asking this is, you know, when I look at independent churches, there is zero politics, zero type of, you know, unnecessary division and conflicts within the church. 
I'm talking with the people, but other mainline churches like people will be like this committee, that committee, this issue, that issue, and you know that really brings down the morale of the intent of you know doing the church. So it's like more of like people driven and thing because there you have bishops, then you have pastors. So pastors can't take independent decisions to function or overnight change certain things. But here in independent churches, since there is not that much of a stronghold, there is so much of uh, flexibility and feasibility, and you can see it by default. The churches are growing, growing, and growing. So who's actually, uh, you know, responsible? Who has to really take that uh, mantle, like in in the main churches? Who do you churches? think should take it? The reason I'm asking that is, you know, because people can't uh, take it because when you approach the pastor, like, see, this is what the bishop, this is what the liturgy, this is what the process, this is what we will continue to do. So they stick on to that, and it's very evident. Uh, you don't see that fivefold ministry there, and pastors don't can't take that thing because their hands are like kind of tied. Hmm. So is it the bishops that have to really make a difference because it's only yearly once they do a conference, then they switch here, there, here, there. But apart from that, you really don't, uh, you know. Uh, see so that. who do you think should take on the responsibility? It's a di dicey question on mainline churches. I'm referring. I to, think so. it's a pastor, right? Okay. The pastor is a shepherd, the sheep of the congregation. So if he's uh, if he is seeing. Uh, the patterns of other churches, and if he's seeing the move of God, if he's seeing people going more to the uh, to the independent and the charismatic churches, then if he's very interested and wants to know, he should kind of study. So he's saying, "Oh, these are some of the things that we need to bring in." And I'm seeing some of the things that the Methodist churches are doing, looking at some of the churches like All People's Church, they're bringing in some of, I say, oh, you know, this is something that they never had. This is something that, you know, they're seeing, they're learning, they're doing things. They're picking up some things, but yet they have to also, you know, they are in that, uh, in that, in the structure that they have placed. But, um, um, uh, you know, when it comes to the move of God and the work of God, uh, you know, when God moves in sin, they, they can tell anyone, whether it's those in authority and bishops, hey, I didn't do anything, it's just God's whole, the Holy Spirit working. I can't stop the Holy Spirit. But what has the pastor basically done? The pastor has basically prayed, prayed, God, that we want... Uh, op uh, yeah, revival. We want uh, to see the gifts of the Holy Spirit being manifested through me, you know. Uh, so he's preaching about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit in, in line with the word. And then he's also, uh, you know, equipping the people in the church, the believers, to go out for missions, evangelism, to go out and make many outreach churches. So all of that can be, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that they can do and the, the pastor can do it and you know uh, the the bishop can't stop him because anyway this is all part of the church mission evangelism everything he's just doing that yeah and god can give us the wisdom uh, and the smartness as well and how to do it and then to see the move of god and nobody can stop the move of god right yes yeah. any any other questions Okay, uh, we'll move on then if there's no more questions to um, restoration of the fivefold um, offices. Okay, um, so along with the revivals, we see restoration of the fivefold offices. You, I've already mentioned about it. Um, you know, uh, so during the dark ages, these uh, fivefold offices uh, became you know, mostly non-existent, okay? And as uh, reformation and revivals progressed, we see people beginning to function in these ministry offices. So if you look at page number uh, 79, okay, um, we see in the 20th century, more and more people began to operate in these ministry areas. Um, 
they began to understand the ministry functions and um, it was well established in the churches. So these ministry offices became fully restored in the church and few of the names are mentioned there on page number 79 and uh, 80. Okay. Uh, do all of you online students have your publication, the PDF copy open before you? Because I just wanted you to read the names. Okay, only Lucy is showing a thumbs up. What about the others? The others, are you all there in class? Uh, do you have the PDF copy of the... Okay, thank you, Abhishek. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Sam. Anyone else? Okay, I think this is only three out of the 14, so I'll have to read it out. <laughs> okay. So uh, we look at some of the, the evangelists, the office of the evangelist, how it was restored in the starting the 1950s. So some of the evangelists like Catherine Kuhlman, uh, William Brenham, uh, Allen, uh, Lester, Jacko, Oral Roberts, Billy Graham, uh, Charles and Francis Hunter, uh, T.L. and Daisy Osborne, uh, 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 you know, DGS Dinner Curran, Raynard Bonke, Benny Hinn, and Randy Clark. So all of these were evangelists. The Office of the Evangelist was restored from the 1950s. And so we see all of these people uh, during that time. Uh, so the office of the pastor and teacher was also, we see, beginning to emerge in the 1960s. And uh, the office of the, sorry, the office of teacher began to emerge in the 1960s and the office of the pastor was restored in the 1970s. So we have uh, Kenneth Hagen, Derek Prince, uh, Bill Johnson still uh, alive today. Um, and we see prophets, uh, we see the ministry of the, and the function of the prophets being fully restored uh, in the 1980s. We see Kenneth Hagen, uh, Bill Heyman and uh, DGS uh, Dinakaran. DJS Dinakaran was is from uh, India, from uh, South India, and one of the men of God who uh, basically moved in all most of the nine gifts of the spirit. But you know how long he had to wait for uh, to speak in tongues? It took him seven long years of praying and waiting to speak in tongues. But after he spoke in tongues, he was mightily moving in almost all the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, okay? The apostle, we see the ministry function being uh, uh, um, fully restored of the apostle in the 1990s. Uh, we see Bill Heyman, uh, Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson is pastoring the church at Red of, Reed of uh, not Reed of, sorry, <laughs> Red of California, and uh, Randy Clark. I think Randy Clark is also... Uh, still alive, I think, yes, because P Pastor Bill Johnson mentions a lot about Randy Clark. I don't know if he's still alive, but I think he is, okay? Um, so, uh, just to clarify, the, um, the apostles and prophets that we're talking about uh, who are in the fivefold office of the church today, they are not the same as they differ from the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Uh, which we read in Revelation chapter 21, verse 14, and also the founding apostles of the church in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20. Okay, so today's apostles and prophets basically fulfill the ministry function. What is the ministry function? To edify, build the ch uh, church and the saints. Okay, so that is um, the difference that is there okay yeah okay it's time up but we'll stop here any questions no questions okay so i'm looking forward for next week um, just to see um, some of your uh, lovely faces, just to get to know you all, to hear your voices. Also, you all can get to see our in-person students. Uh, so I think it'll be a good time of fellowship and just to get to know each other and also to learn from each other. So don't be nervous, just feel free and, you know, share it and uh, we can all just learn from each other, okay? And if anyone has any questions, we can also ask you. So don't feel uh, scared. 
we're always here to help okay if you don't know the answer you can just say the holy spirit will help you <laughs> i'm just joking okay thank you everyone have a blessed uh, day and i'll see you tomorrow for our kingdom of god class thank you yes you'll have to come in front of the camera